So does that mean it's recording? Yep, it's recording now. All right, so over here on the intro slide, we have a, what is known as a hex editor and hex data. We're going to be taking quite an in-detail look about these pretty soon. But this isn't just like any old lecture. Like when I'm going along, be sure to ask any questions for any clarities, anything you could possibly like to know. Just go ahead and ask me and I'll try and answer your question as best as I can. And when I, and there will be a part where I do some demo code to showcase reading and writing some of these formats. And if you want, you can follow along with me if you have a way to run say C sharp or any coder that would be able to read and write binary data. Usually there's binary readers and writers. If you don't, do not worry too much about it as I'm just mainly going to be walking through it. So let's get started. So first off, I should explain what a binary format is. Now, as you know, all data that is digital is stored in binary or just raw ones and zeros. And the great mystery is how do we get from ones and zeros to the files you have on your computer? You have music, you have videos, you even have actual programs themselves made of ones and zeros, but how does that all work? And that's because we're storing what is known as binary representations of data. And norm we can use that binary data to represent text or we can use it to represent the other types of data as well, such as programs and text files. So if I just open up a text editor, I'm using Sublime Text 2, but you could use anything such as Notepad. And if I were to say, or just open this Notepad, you have a hello world.txt. Now, if I were to just drag in this C++ file and work on it and open it up, you can see that's just plain text. And even some scripts such as uh, this assembly language script for ARM, that's still a text file. But of course, if I were to drag in an exe file, you get random gibberish because it's not a text file. Although you may see that some parts of the file are made of text. Do not edit those though, as that can cause some problems if you do not know what you are doing. And there's a lot of different types of file or formats and the main two are typically text or binary. Like you can break any other types of formats as subcategories. Text file formats are technically binary too, but I don't technically count them as such. But what are some advantages and disadvantages to binary formats? Because like you saw that we are able to represent code in text files. So why don't we just have everything in a text file where it's readable? Well, they're actually binary file formats are usually much, much quicker because rather than just interpreting numbers or sorry, interpreting characters as in, imagine if you had to for a program, instead of just being able to execute instructions on the processor directly, the processor had to first parse all this text to execute the instruction. Well, you may say, well, Python exists and that's a pretty popular language. And that's true because Python does execute text while it's an interpreted language, meaning that interprets text rather than raw binary but it's still technically slower than a compile language then. Because when you have a C++ file, as in over here, when you compile it, it turns into raw assembly. And what assembly is, it's machine code that the processor likes. What I mean by that is the processor can just execute those instructions directly rather than playing a game with telephone with another program. So you're already at running faster because you're closer to what the processor wants. There's no middleman there. 
but then there's things such as bytecode, which are in between, where it's a binary format that's not processor instructions, but it's close to it. But that's kind of outside the scope of this. And another problem with binary formats, you may have know, is you can't edit them by hand. Like, obviously, this is an exe. That's meant to be write only. You're not supposed to be able to edit an exe. But let's say I had this WAV file. I, <laughs> do any of you think you can edit this to try and get music? No, I, I don't think so. And when you have an image such as this random image here, if I were to edit this, this is not an efficient way of image editing. When, how people usually do image editing or music editing is you use another program that's specifically designed to be able to read and write these kinds of formats. As you know, when we try and read it ourselves, we can't. And usually binary file formats are smaller in compression because rather than text, which usually there's many different methods of storing text compression, but if we were to only store the data we needed for music, we can do some clever compression tricks. One clever compression trick with music specifically is to rather than pr have just the raw values of the music, we can shorten the range of our possible values so that rather than storing, say, over 4 million different types of intermediate values, we can store only, say, 255. And now we're taking up one byte rather than four, and that's just shorter. And then you can execute different compression methods that are geared to it such as LZZ7 7 compression, which is used for some files. And when you use files such as zip files and RAR files, those have many different types of compressions that used. If not, those files would usually come out pretty massive. If you've ever looked at what's inside a zip file and the size of the zip file and compared the two, they are usually a lot different. And, hard, and when you use a binary format, they're harder to crack. Say I'm using, a, say I'm working for a company and I want to design a file format that stores some sort of data. And now instead of saying name me for like age 19, well, 18 technically. Now, this is pretty easy to crack. I mean, you could just have a number and the name here, but if I were to make it this random gibberish you saw in Notepad earlier, then you would have a hard time of understanding. Let me show you an example. So this is an STAT file, which uh, Nintendo uses for storing data in DS music. And let's say I want to try and look at what it contains. There's still a lot of gibberish in here. And if I were to open like this file right here, and while it's easier, even though I don't have any labels to the data, you can still just see the data like, I may not know what that is, but it's easier to figure out. So overall, binary file formats can be secure, more secure. And they can, you can also employ clever encryption taxes, tactics with them as well. All right, so overall, we've been going over some of the lame intro stuff. Now here's where we start to actually do stuff and get to explore for ourselves what I'm talking about. Now, how it'd be kind of stupid to look at files as ones and zeros. I mean, you could do that. You could take any file, any text file, any type of file in general and look at it as just plain ones and zeros. 
but that'd be inefficient because what we usually do as programmers is we group data in groups of eight. So let me just open up this hello world at text. Now this is what is known as a hex editor. On the top here, we have an offset for where we are in the file. We also have more smaller offsets that where it increments our position in the file though. And on the right, we have a text translation of our message. And you can see we just have a plain hello world. And if I move this over here, you can see that these are all just fundamentally ones and zeros. But if you look at one of these numbers, you'll know something special that there's exactly eight ones or zeros in one of these. This is what is known as a byte. So when you have something that's like five kilobytes, that means you have five times 1,024 of those bytes or simply 5,000 if you're just round rounding. And when you have one megabyte, you have 1,024 of those kilobytes or some people just round to 1,000. And these are the fundamental units of storage. We typically don't just uh, go in bytes, but this is, we don't measure in bits typically, but we measure in whole eight bits or bytes. This is what is known as HXD. It's a free hex editor that you can use. Other programs include GHEX and Hex Workshop. GHEX is for Linux users and Hex Workshop is a Windows program. This program is Windows, but I have had great success in having it work perfect in Wine for Linux users if you want to use it as well. And so now let's move on. So now instead of, now let's get into what hexadecimal is. So imagine we're counting. So let me just uh, make a random or new file for simplicity. So now let's go up. So a byte can store zero, any number from zero to 255, but there's only two digits. So how do we store 255 different values with only two digits? And why is it 250 or 256 different values, may I ask? It's because we have eight bits. And all eight of these bits can either be one or they can be zero. So if I make a change here, you can see that changes that there. And if I were to go through all the possible combinations of these different bits, you would end up with 256. So that means the max value you can have is 255 because zero counts as one of those. And you'll see that we have letters here rather than numbers. Well, that makes sense because we can't use, we can't count up to 255 because that would use three digits in our number system we need to have only two digits. And when we do the math, we end up with having five extra digits. We have A, B, C, D, E, and F. Well, that's A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, yeah, I was right, five. Just wanted to make sure I was saying the correct thing. And if we look at nine, this is just the standard number nine, but now we go to zero A, and now all of a sudden we're at 10. So now if we go to B, we're at 11. F, we're at 15. I'm sure you can figure out all the values in between. But now you're probably wondering what happens if we do what we think is 10? Well, let's do that. And you'll see that it counts from 16. And why is it 16? It's 10. No, it's not. 10 is decimal. We're in hexadecimal. So now what we're saying is we have one group of 16s plus zero. And if we look at the conversion formula, 
we have, let's say we have the number one AF. That means we have one times 16 to the second power plus 10 times one to the first power plus 15. Now, this is really confusing to some people who've never used hexadecimal before. So let me show you a trick. You're going to want to open up a calculator. Go to the three bars and hit programmer right here. And you can see we have a lot of different types of numbers here. This is what's called the programmer calculator. It allows us to do make numbers into different bases. As you can see, we have hexadecimal, decimal, octal, and binary. Mostly you're going to want to use decimal, hexadecimal, and binary. I don't know anyone who still uses octal. Octal's like hexadecimal, but rather instead of 16 different characters, you have eight. So you only have digits zero through seven. It's weird. But let's say I want the number 255 in decimal. Oh, look, here's 255 in hexadecimal, FF. Well, what if I have the 1AF in hexadecimal I had earlier? I type in 1AF. Oh, that's our equivalent of 431. And if you click this button over here, you can edit the raw bits themselves. And this will give you a greater grasp of how bits impact numbers. So we can see 1, 2, 4, 8, 10, or decimal 16. And I'm sure you're noticing a pattern there. Anyways, I advise you to just keep playing around with these numbers, and you'll eventually get, get an intuition of how these numbers work. Because when I see a number like 33, I can... I can just basically read off my top of the head, oh, that's decimal 51. You just kind of get a sense after a while. If you look at this number system long enough, you will just get used to it. But you don't even have to use Windows Calculator because look, it tells me the value right here. Isn't that useful? And if I highlight two of these bytes, you can see that we have different ways to look at it. I'm going to this explain the difference about what this is. But basically what you need to know is 8 is 1 byte, 16 is 2 bytes, 32 is 4 bytes. And why they say 32 for 4 bytes is the fact that there's 32 bits. Because if we look at 1 byte right here, that's 8 bits. So we call that an int 8 or a uint 8. And now this seems kind of weird of a placement. I probably should have put this slide before the one I was just on because I was talking about hex editors earlier. And now rather than opening one of our file, these files in Notepad, let's try opening in them in a hex editor. So we have the JPG file, a WAV file, and let's drag the SDAT into, why not? So here's an image file in a hex editor. As you can see, there's a lot of numbers and gibberish on the right. This gibberish is the same gibberish that you saw in Notepad. But now we also have another way to look at it with numbers. And these will be very important in the future. We have our EXE program. And it's exactly what you would expect. Our SDAT. And huh, it's starting to look a lot. This starts to look more interesting now because now then a bunch of rather than gibberish, we have text here, but there seems to be some sort of pattern to how it looks. And we're going to get into patterns soon enough. But let's keep that in mind and look at our WAV file. It doesn't look exactly like gibberish. It looks like order gibberish now. We still may not be able to understand this just yet, but we're closer now. We now know that there is some sort of structure to these files. They're not just all random gibberish, but there's a way to read them. And we're going to get into that. 
So now that we're starting to learn that there is a way to read files, they're not just complete nonsense. Let's try and make our own. Like it seems to a stretch to just go from random gibberish to making our own, but I feel that making our own will be the best way to. How did you get them to have a bit more structure? Like so, what button did you click? Sorry, I completely. I didn't click any button. Instead of opening them up with Notepad instead, I opened them up with the hex editor. Ah, uh, okay. So look at this sample SDAT. It's a bunch of weird stuff, right? But mm -hmm. if I look at it in the hex editor, something's different about it now. It starts to look more sensey. It's okay. still random numerical gibberish, like there's just a bunch of random numbers, but there seems to be some sort of structure to the numbers. They're not just scattered randomly. Okay, cool. And so what I want to do is invent our own custom file format. So say we want to make our own custom fi file format. I'm just going to call it a .smpl file for sample. And let's say we have an identifier that tells what the file is. We have a number that tells us how many samples we are. And we have a four byte unsigned integer and a null terminated strain for each sample. So basically what I'm saying is let's go to our sample format earlier. Let's reverse the order and say we have a number and we have a name. So we have the age of a person and we have the name of the person. So we have, a, so we have 18 for my age and Michael. And let's say we can also store another people. So let's store um, 16 Christopher for my brother. So let's say we wanted to store this type of data in, a, in our own custom binary file. Let's see how would we do that. So first let's go into a hex editor and let's take a look at some of these files. Now you may notice that for the first four bytes of any of these random files, they typically have some kind of letter. Okay, okay JPG, you're kind of weird. You're throwing everything off by putting your four bytes over here. but. Okay, the text file's just different because it just, all the bytes just correspond to random text, so you don't need. But we call this four byte number at the beginning a magic or some sort of header that tells us what it is. So let's say when I'm designing my file format, if I type in the text section, I can type text. And so there we go. We, uh, let's just set, declare our file format SMPL. So now we have, can I make this on top? Oh, wait, it's on top. Come on, I just saw it. There we go. What that is, it's a program I just have that makes it so if I hit control and space, at the same time, if I hit control and space at the same time. <laughs> it just didn't launch, that's why. It, it's not here. One second. There we go, now I have it running, that was weird. So now I have it so I can display both of these data at the same time. Okay, so now we have our SMPL file format. Let's just say I want to go to, oh, let's copy this directory. What is going on? Okay, let's just call this sample.smpl. So we have our sample format and we have two people that we want to store the data of. We have me and my brother. 
So we need to have a way to tell this file that we have two people. So the easiest way to do that would be to create a number right after. So let's just say we have a number for representing the number of people. But the size is important because if I have one byte, that means I can only store 255 people. If I have two bytes at their max value, that means I can store 665,535. These numbers are powers of two minus one, which is why they're so iconic. If I have three bytes, well, most programs don't use three bytes. They just typically don't. But if I have four bytes, I can store a lot of numbers. And that's kind of like the main difference between 32-bit and 64-bit addressing. Because if I have 32-bit bytes, you can, have you ever used a USB or an SD card and try to copy a five gigabyte file to it? What happens? It just doesn't work, right? And the reason why it does that is because a lot of things uh, like the FAT32 file system uses four bytes to describe the size of something. And if I were to translate this number to a raw number of bytes, it would be 4.29 gigabytes. So if I were to have a five gigabyte file, it wouldn't have a number big enough to store it. So we would either have to part put it would either have to chop the file up into different parts or just not let you do it entirely, which is why you can't do, copy a five gigabyte file to say random USB. Most, most ways of storing files are smarter than that though. But for the most part, I think four bytes is enough storage. So, now let's actually get into storing our number. Do I talk about Endy in here? Ah, yes I do. So we have two people, so we want this to say the number two. And again, we have signed versus unsigned. So what an unsigned byte is, it allows us to have a negative number. So you can see right here that this is negative one because the interpretation of negative one for four bytes is FFFFFFF. But if I do negative two, it does that. But do, can we have negative people? No, we really can't. I, I said we really can't. I know some of you are thinking of some sort of weird scenario or situation where you'd have negative people, but typically we can't store the amount of data for negative people. So let's just type in two. And now we have two at the beginning. And this is probably confusing for a lot of people. It's like, because when we write the number 18, we don't we do it in the order of 18. We don't say 81, we say 18. But if we look over here, we say instead of 0002, we see 02000. What? Why is it doing that? I'm sure this is pretty confusing, but watch what happens if I toggle this right here and then I type in the number two. Sure, it's some random large value now, but if I type in the number two, this is how what we would expect it to look like. But if you realize what I did right here is I changed what is called the byte order. Now the byte order has different names. Some people call it the byte order. Some people call it the endian. As you can see, we have little or big endian. Or, and some people call it and for some reason, IDA Pro, which is a common disassembly tool, calls it the byte sex. Why? I don't know. It's, there's just multiple way, it, they're just multiple ways of describing the same thing. 
And basically that means, say I had the number over here, let's just space things out, six, five, seven, eight. And we have the number 200, two, five, nine, seven, six. So if I were to swap the endian and do that same two, five, nine, seven, six, you would see that rather than being, it didn't just swap the individual digits, but it swapped the bytes. And that's because endian doesn't affect the order of the bits. It affects the order of the bytes. But why? Why do we have two different ways of saying the order of bytes? And it all goes down to how processors work at the end of the day. Different types of processors store numbers or their bytes in different orders. The x86 or the x64 order computer or processors, I mean, store would store this two first in what's called little endian. What that means is the least significant bit is stored first, or least significant byte, I mean. So this two is the smallest. And if I were to put this one here, it this one is massive because it's one zero 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 two. And that makes sense because if I have the number, say this in plain decimal, we all know that this part is very small compared to this one over here because it's more left. And that's kind of how byte order works. Rather than saying, hey, this part is the most important, we can say, hey, this part at the front is the least important. Meaning that instead, this two would be massive. Like it's a weird backwards way of thinking but processors just do that. Like the x64, x86 processor, which are used in computers, do this. ARM processors, which are used in the phones, DS, Nintendo Switch, do this as well. But, big ND, but there are some big Endian processors, such as the old types of Macs used to use what is called power PC processors, which were big Endian. And you have, um, I forget if MIPS is big or little Endian, but just know at the end of the day, it depends on the processor. And back in the day, this was a big deal because you would have to transform all this data in order to read it correctly. But nowadays you can, the performance difference of changing all the order of data is almost negligible. So now when you store data as big or little endian, it's typically seen as more of a design choice rather than anything performance wise. Although most of the time, like this wave file, it, which is used for wave sound data is in little endian. And you'll see that a lot of formats are in little endian as well. It just depends on the format. But some file formats actually let you choose the endian of it. And what we usually do this is what's called a byte order mark, which is FEFF. So if we go back to this SDAP file, this file format allows you to save it in big or little, little endian. Now DSs are always little endian, so I don't know why it gives you this choice, but let's take a look at these digits, F-E-F-F. -F. So this is our big endian representation. If the bytes appear in F-E-F-F -E -F -F order, that means we have big endian. If it's FFFE, it's little endian. So if we look over here, FFFE, that's not the same as that. So this is little endian. Not all file formats have something like this, but typically there's a good chunk of them that do something like this. Like if you have this WAV file here, you won't have any type of byte order because a WAV file is always little endian. It just is. 
So now let's go back to storing our data. So now we know how we're going to store the numbers. Let's just go ahead and store the numbers. So we have two people. So I'm just going to type in the number two and let's keep it at little endian. And then let's have the age of me. Now, I don't believe there's any human that's lived over the age of 255. Maybe there is, but I don't think there has been. So I think it's relatively safe to assume that we can use one byte to represent age. So if I, and I know this is just going to be a hexadecimal 12, it look, it's 18. But now we have a problem. How do we store the name of a person? And while we can have, say, this text, say, Michael, great, we have text. But there's a problem with this. How do we know how big the text is? See, like, we know how big these numbers are because we know we're always going to have four bytes for the count, and we know we're only always going to have one byte for the age. But how do we know how many bytes this is? And sometimes, some, sometimes you'll have a number in the front that tells you how many bytes to use. But one common method that a lot of files do is that they just have two zeros, zero, zero. For those who may be familiar with programming, this is called a null terminator. Not just any programming, but low level programming in say like C or C++. And what this typically lets us know when a string or a sequence of characters is over. Because look at it, the null terminator is not typically used in text. It's usually to say, hey, this text is over. If you're using null terminators in your strings, that'd be kind of weird. And that might actually cause some issues when you're interpreting. So if you were, if you were to say, hey, I have a null terminator inside my name, that could cause some problems because then when they go to read it from the database, they would only pick up these three letters because the null terminator, and that could possibly crash the program that reads it. All right, thank you for joining Janvisha. A recording will be available if you want to look through it another time. So now when we, so now let's go to our second file person, Christopher. So now 16, which is just by decimal 16, it's just hexadecimal 10. And then we can just type Christopher, followed by our null terminator. And there we go. We made our first custom file format. This is only one of the possible ways of storing data. Like we could have had this be two bytes or any number of bytes. And we could have stored these in different ways. Like rather than saying Michael followed by zero, zero, we could have said the number of letters followed by the name, you know, just there's infinite ways to store the same data in binary files. So who cares? So we made our file format. So what, what what's the point? It's, it's kind of hard to read them by hand, isn't it? And this is where we get into reading and writing in our actual programs. So I have a sample C sharp file here, and let's try and read the data that we just wrote. So I'm just going to copy it over here. And we're going to use what is called a binary reader. So first, let's just make a sample class that would showcase our data. So let's say, let's 
say we have person.cs. So we have public class. And so we have a property for the age. And now we can actually specify how big things are. So we have our u short, which is two unsigned bytes, or that would be the equivalent of a uint 16. But we used one byte for the age, not a signed byte, but just a normal byte, age. How old the person is. And then we have a string that stores their name. Now, of course, usually you would store the name first, but I just designed the file format to be backwards to kind of showcase increase in difficulty as we go along. Because before, to, to, in order to understand how to store text properties, it'd make more sense to just store numbers. So let's just say we have a binary reader, br equals new binary reader. Let's just say we have a new file stream. It, don't worry about the to the code too much. Like this depends on platforms. And in fact, this is very inefficient because you're not supposed to just randomly create a file stream because now we're going to have no way to dispose it. And it's bad programming practice, but I'm not worried about that. We just want a way, quick, easy way to read our data. Just going to copy that name. All right, so we have our header, which detypes the type of file, meaning if we don't detect the SMPL at the start, that means our data is bad. So let's just make sure of it. So if br.readchars So now what this line does is it reads the first four characters, these one right here, and it converts that to a string. And if it's not equal to SMPL, then it's going to yell at us for having bad data, which makes sense. So now we have the number of people. So we have four bytes for that. So that would be a U u int 32 but in c sharp that's just called a u int and what this kind of does we can see that we can just read a u int 32 we can also do things such as read a byte or read boolean or read double and a lot of things oh we can just read a string now be careful there's different ways to read a string what this method does is this would actually read a number at the front to see how long the string is and then read the string. So we can't use that for reading the name as we store our data different than how this would read it. So this gives us the number of people. So now let's just declare we have an array called person people equals new. And we're just gonna say that it's how big our, our how many people we have. And now we just run a sample for loop to read all the different people. All right. And so then people to the I well, first we need to declare it as a person, but we can also initialize it with properties. Again, don't, don't freak out about all the C-sharp specific things. I know a lot of you may not know C-sharp or even programming in general. 
This is just to showcase a sample program of how a binary reader works. It's like, see, we have BR, we read the first four chars, we read the first four bytes, and then for each person, we're going to set the age equals, and then we read a byte because we only have one byte for the age, and we have the name. This we need to do something clever for. So let's just make a static string read name binary reader br. And, and this is just going to be a simple program to read an unsigned or a simple program to read a null terminated string or function, I mean. Because what we do is we keep reading the string until we reach zero. So char c equals br.read char. Well, c is not equal zero. Char is the add c. C equals br to read char. And we'll, we can just return what we made as a string. So if we look at this algorithm, it makes kind of sense because we first assign the first letter and we keep reading letters and adding it to our list until we reach the end. So we can just say read name and pass our reader. And now let's just run this sample program. And you can see that we have an exception. That actually took me by surprise, but Let's see what we did wrong. So first, well, let's actually store this in the temporary value bar x equals, whoops. Huh, that's not what it should be. Oh, I'm doing it wrong. See, this is just a weird C sharp specific thing because it just gave us the name of the type. My bad. You're supposed to do that. Again, this is just a weird C sharp thing where it doesn't convert the entire list of characters to a name. But if we look in our program, we now have 18 and our name is, <laughs> whoops. There. Now we're basically going through an order. And now as you can see, we can now take this data that we made and put it in our programs. But why is this a good thing? Because now this isn't just gibberish anymore. This isn't just random data we can create a file format and we can use it in our programs. That's what file formats are mainly for, for having it interpreted by programs. Like if you open a WAV file and say your music player, what the music player has to do is it has to take all the random data 
in the file and it has to interpret it. It has to figure out what it means. And then when it does that, it then plays through your speakers or like this image file. It has to take what the format means and then this viewer right here, once it deciphers all the bytes, it can finally show us what the image is. And now with our file format, our program can take all the bytes of our file and it can display it to us. And now the possibilities are endless. We can make our own custom program to display this out to the user. We can make this to a text file if we wanted to. We could, and we can figure out a way to do the reverse. So let's just do a quick walkthrough of this. So we first read the characters. We read how, number, how many people. And for each person, we read the age and we read the name. As you can see, reading files is a pretty linear fashion. And now you're probably thinking, uh, this is a very tedious process. Do I really have to tell the, do I really have to tell the program how to read every single number? Wouldn't it make more sense to have a way to pass a reader a structure and then just convert that, convert the raw bytes to a structure? And you're completely right, that exists. That's called a serializer. And when we have, and when you make a game for mono game, you have what is called XNB files. Say this rows.xnb. What it does is it takes your content and it figures out how to in automatically convert this data to C sharp classes. How it does that is it says the name of what the, what the class is you're converting it to, and then it has the raw data stored for that class. And many different serializers exist and you can use. Like, and what this allows you to do is just go content.read and then point this to the file. And then all of a sudden, now you have a texture that you can use in the game. And it does all the conversion for you. I'm not going to go over using a serializer though, as they really, really vary depending on what you use. And what's in it? And they, one thing that serializers do is when you use them is they limit the amount of control you can store because when we use a binary reader or writer, we can control every single bit, that byte that gets written. So now we could do the opposite and write the file format. Like instead of, I could do bw.writechars and then smpl, then I can write a uint32 for the number of people and then for each person, I can read it. Would you want me to, thanks Eddie for attending, have fun. All right, does anyone want me to show how you would write, an ex write our example file or do you, do you kind of understand how we would do it? Like in this, it would be like reading but the exact opposite. All right. I'm just going to move on. So here's where I was talking about with serializers, how it can be annoying to recreate a reader and writer. And yeah. All right. 
So now here's where things get interesting. Remember that WAV file earlier? How does music work? I'm sure a few of you, quite a few of you are wondering that. How does music work? How do we take this seemingly random data, this data that has a pattern, how do we convert that to music? But we don't just know off the top of our head how this WAV file works. We could try and figure it out. Like we know that this has riff. And if we were to open a WAV file, this would always open with riff. And if we were to open any WAV file, you'd also see this wave over here. So it is possible to reverse engineer. We could by hand figure out every single byte, what it tries to do, every single number, what it means, but <laughs> let's not, let, let's not do that because that's reverse engineering and that's very painful. So what you usually do is you look up file specifications. So if I were to say open this, the WAV file specification, you can see that, huh, this starts to tell us how to read the WAV file. Oh, that's in the way. So let me make this window a bit bigger and always on top. So WAV files have a master riff chunk, which includes a WAV identifier fire followed by sub chunks. So the data is stored in little endian byte order. So let's see what it says here. This represents the chunk ID in its riff. What do you know? The first four bytes spell out riff. The chunk size equals four plus N. So we have this number here, one C six D C, because remember this is, this is little endian we're talking about. So if I were to highlight everything in this file, in this case, I'll, I'll do a quick select block. Oh, where'd it go? Oh no, this is, there we go. You can see that if I highlight all the data after this number, it creates a size of 1C60C. Oh, that's what that number for. It tells us how much data comes after it. And now after this, we have four bytes for, all right. So now we can see that that matches up. And now we have FMT for format. So if we see the format chunk, it has FMT with a space. Yep, that's true. And then we have a chunk size, which tells us how big it is. And if we look, yep, that tells us this 10 here that corresponds to the 10 that I highlighted. And if I look up the number of channels, oh, this is one. We have one channel. So let's actually start writing down what we know about this wave file. So for our wave file, we have one channel and then at four bytes after that specifies number of samples per second. And what does that mean? What, what does it mean when I say we have a certain number of samples per second? So let's go into a wave editor. I'm just going to open up Audacity. So if I drag my WAV file onto here, you can see that I have two channels. Oh. <laughs> See, whoops, I skipped over the format. The format tag, the see, 
this is you have to be careful when reading file specifications because after the size you have what's called the format code and if you look over here we have the format as PCM so we say our format is PCM and we have two channels because there's a two after that so let's look at this wave file Let's try and understand how this works. So th this kind of thing looks familiar, right? This dots represent our wave data. I think you might have heard that, I don't know. But what happens if I zoom in? If I zoom in enough in one of these graphs, you can see that they're not just really any continuous lines. They're just points. They're just a bunch of points. And what these points do is they tell the speaker how much to adjust to play a sound. So now we have a position of here to here to here. And depending on how much it moves and in what direction. And if we do this for a large continuation of points, we eventually get a sequence of audio. So when we're storing waves, audio data, we're not just store, what we're actually doing is we're storing a bunch of points on the graph to wrap that represents it. It's a weird way of thinking, but let me show you an example of an image. Because at the end of the day, we only have ones and zeros to work with. We need to figure out a way to get m movies, music, videos, anything to ones and zeros. So if I open up my PNG over here, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with pixels. When I zoom into an image, I get a bunch of colors. So, and usually how these colors work is, if I look over here, I have a certain amount of R, I have a certain amount of G, and I have a certain amount of B from zero to 255. That's just how digital colors mainly work. And if you remember earlier, the amount, if you remember earlier, zero through 255 is the exact range of a byte. So when it, so this hex data over here, what this mean, you might have seen this. Well, now it kindly makes sense because we have a number zero for 255 for this, this, and this. So we have three bytes that can represent any color. And usually we have another byte that represents how transparent something is. So now I have a question for all of you. Could you design a file format right now for an image from what you know? And if so, how would you do it? Yeah, that's completely right. I can say how many pixels I have in the X direction, how many pixels I have in the Y direction, and then for every individual pixel, I can have an R value, a G value, and a B value, and then transparency value. But there's one problem with that. So we have a 150 times 150 and that tells us that that is 22,500 pixels. So if I do 22500, and we're going to store four byte, four 
bytes for every pixel, you know, for the RGB. All of a sudden, we're at 90,000 bytes. But if you look, we're only using half that amount for the image. No, yeah, we're only using like less than half of 90,000 for the image. How? If we need four bytes for every pixel and there's 22,500 pixels, how do we have less storage than what we need? So I'm going to make a sample image. Let's say I have oh, this and let's just do a simple pencil. Oh, let's make it show up better. So let's say I have the sample image here. Now this is 480,000 pixels. But I, here's the trick. I only have four colors in this image. I have white, blue, and red, and orange. So rather than four bytes per pixel, what if I were to just use one byte? And if I got really fancy, I can only use like half a byte for each pixel. And if you see, like I can store what is known as a palette. So I can have somewhere in the file that would say, hey, the first color I have is white. Then the second color is red. Then I have orange and then I have blue. Then every pixel would not just be a color, but it would be the number in the palette of what I do of what I have. This is typically how image files work because rather than telling me what each pixel is, it's telling me what color it is. It's color zero, color one, color two. And now all of a sudden, instead of saying 480,000 times four, we're only storing 480,000 bytes, but we can get fancier like this is the compression I was talking about because you can see in this image, there's a lot of blank space, right? So if I were to rather say I can get cool, pretty fancy, instead of saying, hey, there's a white pixel, a white pixel, a white pixel, a white pixel. What if I just said there's 20,000 white pixels right here. Then after that, there's a red pixel. Then after that, there's 15,000 more white pixels. Now the file size of my image is drastically smaller. But that's not always the case because what if I had an image like this? Let's just say I have a simple four by four image like this. Let's just color it all red, but then let's say, all right, now we have a problem. What if I wanna say there's one green pixel, then there's one red pixel, then there's one blue pixel. Now, all of a sudden, we're taking more memory. We need more numbers to say less numbers. So you have to keep these types of things in mind when you design the file format. Because when we come up with a compression method, there's going to be a way to break it. There's going to be a way to say, to make it inefficient. inefficient. Now, rather than say 16 bytes, 
we're going to need 32 bytes to say how many pixels there are. So we ended up doubling our original file size. And of course, the 32 is neglecting the amount of num amount of numbers used for the palette because that's usually going to be negligible compared to the image because we have four different colors and overall this is still a small image overall but it's possible to have large images that have completely random pixels like you can see that we only have a few white pixels before the next color so when you make a compression method you have to be pretty clever with how it's designed. And when we go with the wave data, when we have PCM, that's uncompressed. The data we have stored is just what it is. It's just the raw points. There's, when you have MP3 files, there's a clever compression system in use. And usually when you have to work with data like that, you have to look into the MP3. You have to look into the compression methods they use in order to decode the data, which can be hard because when we have MP3 files, it's, uh, it's a very complex format. It'd be hard for us to make a reader and writer for it. So what we usually do is we have libraries for that. And so now what? Well, now you know how binary file formats work. Hopefully you've got an understanding of how to make your own, how you get to read them, how to interpret them in your programs and such. And overall, they can either be really complex or really simple. Like this format, or this format, this format, these vary in complexity. Like we may not know how complex or simple the random format is, but this format we made is simple. And fundamentally, whenever you make a custom file format, it's going to be relatively simple compared to some random file format because you get to design how it works. You know everything about the file format. However, if you were to just toss your random file to someone else, and hey, here you go, figure it out, then they're going, they might have some trouble figuring out how the file works because they know nothing about it. And for the most part, people don't know about files. Like how many of you in this chat knew how a WAV file worked? How many of you knew how image files? Like how many of you knew exactly how to read these things? Did I do a good job of explaining how, do, how, how they work? Do you now understand how files work? If I were to give you a PNG, a JPG file or PNG file, would you be able to look up the specification and read and figure out how it works? If you wanna look into an image file, I recommend BMP as the first type, as that gives you an, as what I described with the palettes and RLE compression. RLE compression is basically saying, hey, I have this many of pixels that are this color. Those techniques that I described with the images, those are all used in BMP files and they are used in other common formats as well. JPG has its own weird compression format I'm sure a lot of you know JPG is very infamous, if not famous for its weird compression of how terrible it looks. And there's a reason why it does that because it values the compression quality. It values file size more than it values the quality of the image. And that's gonna be a trade-off when you design your images like you have types of lossless compression as what I was describing with the image example. But JPG files use what's called lossy compression. They basically say that we don't need to know every single pixel 
We just need to know what's around a single pixel to figure out how it looks. And so that's generally how files work. Hopefully, <laughs> thank you. Oh, and now one thing you can do on your own is I would say try confusing for person. Like you can like you can easily make a quick but unprotect unprotected secret message in a hex editor or so. Like say I want to convert every character here to a different number. Say I say 4D maps to like uh, 12 or something. And then you can swap the data and and then it and then if you open up in notepad it'd come up as gibberish but if you were to know how to swap them you can essentially make a secret message and that's something i would urge you to try try making a program that that creates a secret message try making a program to read a bmp file like try interpreting the pixels could you make a program to edit an image file for you like, could you make a program to edit X, num X color in the palette to a different one? Like, with file formats, without, like, sure, a lot of libraries exist for handling image file formats or, like, music file formats. But if you didn't have those libraries, what would you do? What if you want to make your own way of storing data? Like there's a lot of applications to files as fundamentally everything on a computer in one way or another is a file. So thank you for attending. I hope this was helpful for people. I know I've been going pretty fast through some of this stuff and I know it can be a lot to take in because this is a completely different way of thinking. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you all later.